Have you ever had a vision and or a dream where God was in this vision or dream? He gave you instructions that impacted and changed your life forever. What are you doing since that dream? What has taken place? In this lesson entitled, The Blessing Passes to Jacob, we're going to see what Jacob did after he had a dream and God spoke to him. There are notes for this lesson. I'll leave a link in the description below. I'll leave a link in the comment section. Click the link, get your notes, your Sunday school books, and your Bibles. For the Kojic Legacy edition of the Sunday school is now in session. And join me. Let's go. Teaching the Word of God in the spirit of excellence. Join Elder Rodney Jones with our Sunday school lesson. Building and equipping the children of God. Grab your Bibles, grab your notes. Get your lessons and get ready. Now let's go. Hello and welcome to Sunday School. Welcome to another glorious day that the Lord has blessed us. I am the host, the pastor, uh, Dr. Rodney Jones of the New Nation Anointed Ministries, Church of God in Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, we're located at 1700 West 87th Street in the city of Chicago. Our zip code is 60620. If this is your first time, please leave me a note or a comment in the comment section below. I'd like to welcome you to Sunday School. You can also drop me an email at rodneyjonessundayschool at gmail.com. Make sure you like and subscribe to this channel. Hit that subscribe button, click that bell notification, and click all so YouTube will notify you. Bing! He just uploaded another lesson. Yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. Make sure you grab your notes. Very interesting lesson on today. We're dealing with the blessing that passes to Jacob. My question was, have you ever had a dream and or an a vision or vision? And yes, I said and of a vision earlier as well. That it impacted and or changed your life. What have you done since this vision? Since the Lord met you wherever he met you. Maybe it was at your house or whatever. What have you done with that vision since the Lord showed it to you, gave it to you, made covenants and promises? In today's lesson, we're going to see that Jacob not only received this, but Jacob also made a promise that, uh, or a vow, the vow, the Bible says, of what he was going to do. You see me looking down, I got a new project, product uh, at the foot at my feet, and I'm excited about this. We're in Genesis, the 28th chapter, verses number 1a, then we jump to uh, 10 verses uh, 10 through 22. This is October 29th. Father, we thank you for this day and we glorify you and let your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first bit of information is the Bible truth. The Bible truth says that we can rely on God to never leave us or forsake us. You find that also in Hebrews 13 and 5, where he said that he would never leave, nor would he ever abandon or forsake us regardless of what goes on in our life. The memory verse is, And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. That's Genesis the 28th chapter, verse number 15, of which we're going to talk about that since it is a part of this lesson. Our Bible learning says that God assures Jacob of God's presence, and he promises that through Jacob and his offspring, all families of the earth will be blessed. We're going to talk about that. Who is this uh, offspring? Who is this seed that all nations of uh, his seed or of the families or of the earth is going to be blessed? But we know that God assures uh, to Jacob that his presence will go with us or with him, and Jacob need not worry nor fear because of that. And lastly, our lesson aim says, cherish God's presence in our personal experience. 
So by the end of this lesson, we're going to cherish God's uh, presence in our personal experience. And then we're going to invite God's presence into our everyday activities. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get right into this particular lesson. We are in uh, um, Genesis, the 28th chapter, verses 1a. Then we jump to verses 10. Thank you for the A, culture. <laughs> and Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So now we got a conversation. We got a big jump from the ninth verse all the way to the 10th verse. What has taken place in this whole thing is the fact that Abraham had Isaac. Isaac married Rebekah and he had twins. There were twins born unto both of them. There were twins by the name of Esau and Jacob. Jacob being the youngest one. The thing is, Jacob was uh, called a heel planter. He grabbed the heel of his brother when he comes out. His mother is part of a trick that Jacob plays on the father because Jacob was loved by his mother. Esau was loved by his father because of the gain or the hunting that Esau did. And he was able to kill this game and feed his father. His father loved them because of that. But Jacob, his mother loved him. He remind her of herself and her, on, her father, her uncle, and all of them. Prior to this and in this very chapter, uh, first of all, before we get to this, Esau sells his birthright to Jacob because Esau was starving. He was at the point of death per his testimony. And in order for him to eat the victuals that Jacob had, he had to sell his birthrights. And the Bible said that Jacob or uh, Esau despised his birthrights. Lastly, number two, during this session of this week's lesson, uh, before we get to this actual verse, Esau, father tells him to go into the field because I'm going to bless you because Isaac is getting ready to die. His mother, Rebecca, hears this conversation while Isaac is in the, in, uh, Esau is in the field. Jacob's mother says to him, we need to play a trick on your daddy. Go get the kid, put the skin on so you can smell like him. He goes and says, who is this? He says, I'm Esau. Sound, you sound like Jacob, but you smell like Esau. And so he blesses Jacob. When Esau returns, he's hurt because not only does his brother have his birthrights, his brother now received his blessing. I'm going to show you in this lesson that Jacob receives a twofold double blessing. And so when he gets through, now Esau sets out to kill his brother Jacob after his father passes on. His mother knows this. His mother says, boy, I need to send you to my uncle's house. She tricks her husband, Jacob, uh, uh, Isaac, and says, uh, I need him to go get him a wife from my family. And it's urgent that he go do this. And so the Bible says then that Jacob is called in by Isaac a second time and receives this blessing and tells him to leave. That's a long uh, history, but I want it to be able to explain something for everybody to get a hold of so that you can take the bits and parts and pieces of the history that you need. All right. But don't ever go that length <laughs> in your lesson. So then we, our lesson opens up with the fact that Isaac called Jacob. He blessed him. He charged him. And then he sends him away. Verses number 10 says that Jacob is on his way to Beth Beersheba. He was, or, or he's leaving, I should say, he left. So he went out from there. He's on his way to Haran, which is a very interesting place. And something takes place while he's en route. Now that might be some 450 miles travel. But in this lesson, he only probably will hit 45 miles because God will stop him. Oh, this is going to get good. 
Let's see what happens. Genesis 28 and 11 says, and he lift or he lighted. Watch that word lighted. He lighted upon a certain place. Ladies and gentlemen, that word place shows up a lot. He lighted upon a certain place and tarried, which means he stayed. He uh, tarried overnight, all night, because, now watch this. You got to be very careful. The sun was set and he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay himself down to go to sleep. Now, there's something that I want to pull out of this particular thing. In this travels towards Haran, he makes a stop. The Bible says that he lighted upon a certain place. Some of your Greek translations will, will say the. He lighted upon the place. The place means this is a specific place. Because the word place shows up many times in this lesson. It shows up in verse 11 as a certain place. It shows up in verse 11 as that place. And in verse 11 at that place. So he lighted upon the place. He took stone of that place and he lay down in that place. And then he says, sure that the Lord is in this place, verses number 16. But he also says, how dreadful is that place or this place, verse 17. And then he called the name of that place Bethel, verses 19. So I need you to know that place really is a key word. It is actually a key word. It is mentioned multiple times in this particular lesson and everything is going to take place. That being said, it looks like that he entered into this place by the uh, sovereign will, authority and power and predestination of God. It doesn't appear that he just laid down because the sun because he says he lighted, which means to encounter, to meet, to reach, or to entreat, to reach. He reached a certain place and he tarried to lodge, to stop over, to pass the night, or even to abide. So he travels this place. And, and, and I need you to understand that this is around, according to Genesis 12 and 8, this is around the same place that God spoke to his father or grandfather Abraham. Remember, he is in the land of Canaan. So he is somewhere in the vicinity where God spoke to his father concerning the same land. So it's no accident nor coincidence. So I need you to know that sometimes God may not speak to us until we reach that certain place. God didn't speak to him until he reached that certain place. God spoke to Moses when he reached that certain place called the burning bush in Exodus 3. Now, watch this. So the Bible said that the sun set. He, he did that. He lighted because uh, the sun was set, which means it settled. It came down. It positioned itself as well in an area or down, which causes darkness, which is causes him to stop. That is all a move of God because God is getting ready to confirm his uh, promise and covenant that he made with Abraham in the same area. Everything we do is not coincidental. There are times when uh, the sovereignty of God shows up in our life. The providence of God shows up in our life and God will cause us to be at a certain place or a certain time. Uh, because he's got to speak to us concerning a certain thing, as uh, Sister Kamichos uh, will say, certain instead of certain. Certain. <laughs> and so what he did was he laid down and he took the stones in that place and he made them pillows so that he can go to sleep. Verses number 28. And Here's what happened. He dreamed. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the act of God. Because he appeared unto his father or Abraham a certain way as well. He dreamed and behold a ladder. A ladder that were set up. You're going to find that word set up uh, that's going to continue to be throughout this uh, scripture or the word set, the word set 
will be throughout this word scripture as well. He dreamed and behold a ladder uh, set on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. So we see that the base is on earth. Mm -hmm. But the top of it is in heaven. Did I spell heaven right? Yes, I did. <laughs> and behold, and behold, I look at repeated words. And behold, the angels of God, look at what they were doing. He saw them ascending. They were going up and he saw them uh, descending. Now, watch this. So this is a dream, remember, that he's having. But this dream is going to impact and to change his life forever. This dream is going to cause him to go in a direction that he never would have gone in. What direction did you go in when you received the dream? How was that working out for you? What are you doing? You know, dreams do come true, providing that you don't oversleep. <laughs> so this dream is about to change his life forever. At this point, Jacob is running for his life from his brother. He deceived his father and his brother. Uh, he's in the middle of nowhere, possibly alone. It's now dark. He's sleepy and he's prepared to go asleep on a stone. And scripture does not say if he rode an animal or not, or if there was anybody with him. It appears that he walked and it appears that he is there by himself. He is in a strange place, what appears, and his life is in shambles because of the trickery that he did upon his brother, thanks to his mother. So he enters into the dream in the middle of nowhere, but what he dreams is worth it all. In his dream, he sees a ladder. Some of your scriptures will say a stairway because it is called here a ladder, but technically and actually it was a stairway that he saw and the stairway went from the earth up to heaven. And then he says it set up, it was set up, which means to stand or even to be stationed. And it went from the earth. And at times, and especially at this point, the word, word earth means the land. So the land that he was on, which at the end I'll show you, was Canaan that he saw this. So this is a picture of free access of the angels of God that will be going from heaven to earth and from earth back to heaven. The Bible lets us know that his angels are ministering spirits. The first chapter of the book of Hebrews the 11th uh, verse, and they are performing the will of God. And Jacob sees this in a picture. And not only that, lay down, he says, and behold, there's the word behold again. Now look at how, what he sees, he sees the Lord, the Lord. And look at the posture of God. He stood above it, the it being the ladder. So he's at the top of the ladder. And then, ladies and gentlemen, God speaks. He's the first God and the only God throughout Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, that has a mouth that can move, that can make a covenant, that creates. Why are we listening to God that doesn't ex gods that doesn't exist? Gods that we have to make like money, like cars, like jobs, like situations, when we ought to be listening to a God who is the self-existent. Because that word God, uh, Lord, here is he is the self-existent. He is the self-existent. He exists. Uh, some of y'all might have an A there. He exists because he exists. He told Moses that I am that I am. The word am means to exist. I exist because I exist. So he says, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord. Now it looked like he said, I am the Lord God. But actually he says, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father and the God of Isaac, who is your father as well. So at times the word father here means grandfather. Yes. And at times it means founder, it means head, it means leader, so on and so forth. But he says, I am the same God who called your father Abraham. So whatever Abraham has been talking to you about, 
I am the one who caused Abraham to be here. Everything that your father has, everything he has been blessed with, everything your father told you about how he got it and who he got it from, I'm the one. I'm the God of Abraham. I met Abraham in the 11th chapter, before the 12th chapter, and I spoke to him and called him from his family. I led him, brought him here to this location, and I covenanted it with him by the cutting of a covenant that I would deed him this land. And then I met with your father, Isaac, as a God, because I promised Abraham that I would be a God to his seed, and I have kept my covenant with him. And now here I am confirming the oath that I made with him. So the scripture says in verses 13, that behold, the Lord stood above him and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father and the God of Isaac. He says the land, he gets right to it, the land that you're on. So that tells me, ladies and gentlemen, that he is in Canaan. The land that you're on, he says, I will give it to you and I'm going to give it to your seed. Give. I'm going to grant it. I'm going to allow you because I have already deeded it to your father. The word stood, the Lord stood. It means to stand. It means to be stationed just like the word where to the word set up in verses 12. So set up and he stood both means to be stationed. He says, I'm giving it to you, which means to grant it and which means to bestow. Now his children is going to be called the children of Israel because God is going to change his name from Jacob to Israel in Genesis 35 and 10. So this is the particular seed that he's referencing at this point. But watch this. There are some other things that's getting ready to take place with this promise that God has given him. He says, and thy seed, your chillings. <laughs> Or your children shall be. Now watch this. He tells them how much. If you can tell me how much dust, if you can literally count the particles and articles of the dust, then you can tell me how many children you're going to have. Your children are going to be as the dust of the earth and you shall spread, which means you're going to multiply which says that you can't die. Ladies and gentlemen, he is running for his life. He is fearful of his life. His brother has already put in his heart that he's going to kill his brother once his father dies. God just told that this man that you're not going to die. Your brother cannot kill you. There's no circumstance, no situation, no nothing that can cause you to leave this earth until my will concerning you has been fulfilled. I promise your father Abraham and I promise your, your son, your father Isaac, and now I'm promising you and Jacob through you. So we see that the blessing that God has given has come through these particular ones. Now, he says in verses 14 that now I should say God introduced him as the Lord, the Lord. I'm the self-existent. Now, he says in thee uh, shall all or in thee and in thy seed. Watch this. Shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, first, he says you're going to spread in all four directions. You're going to spread in the west, the east, the north. And the south of which he told Abraham the same thing. Now watch this. And in thee and in thy seed. Ladies and gentlemen. Right there. In your seed, all families of the earth going to be blessed. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to know. That that word blessed right there is justified. And I'll tell you why in a, a minute. Uh, so Abraham, the Bible said that he believed God and it was imputed upon him as righteousness. That righteousness 
So we look at, we spoke about this on last week. When, Abra, when God says to Abraham, I will bless thee, I will bless those that bless you, I will curse those that curse you, I will give you this land, I will bless your seed. The I wills of God there and even now is what we call the covenant of God and all the promises of God. But the scripture says that Abraham believed God or believed in the Lord and it was accounted unto him or imputed unto him as righteousness. That is called the blessing of Abraham. So God says to his son, uh, Jacob, in your seed and in through you, all nations or all families of the earth are going to be blessed. Blessed with that same blessing that I bless Abraham with. This is not land. This is not money. This is not wealth. This is not health. This is justification. This is righteousness. This is salvation. Even David spoke about it. You can find it in Galatians. You can find it in Romans, the fourth chapter as well. So God says, in, he even said to Isaac, in your seed, all families or nations of the earth is going to be blessed as well. So right now, we are justified or blessed because God has forgiven us of our sins through faith which means all we had to do was have faith in God for him to declare us righteous or the righteousness of God. So he says, in your family, in your seed, all the families of the earth is going to be blessed. And behold, that word behold keeps showing up. Behold, I am with thee. That's his presence. Will keep thee. In all places, whither thou goest, will bring thee again uh, into this land. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Canaan, which means regardless of where he goes, regardless of what takes place, regardless of his brother, regardless if he gets to Haran or back, regardless of what Laban does to him, God says, I'm promising you that you're going to come back to this land. And the reason he says that this is going to happen. Now, let me show you this. I need you to see this. Will, here, keep thee in all the places thou goest. Will, bring thee again into this land. Will, not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken. That word spoken means promise. Or even covenanted. I'm going to keep my covenant is what he says. So Jacob can now rest for fear while he is running. Abraham was blessed by God, Genesis 13, 14 through 18. Isaac was blessed by God, Genesis 26, 3 and verse 24. And now Jacob is blessed by God. He says, I am with thee. The word with implies among, I'm before you. I am beside you. I, my presence is with you. He says, and I will keep you. The word keep means to guard, to keep watch over, to ward, to protect, and to save your life. I'm going to keep you wherever you go, which means wherever you depart, wherever you move, wherever you proceed, wherever you walk away or walk about, wherever your presence is, my presence will be there. He says, I will not leave you. The word leave means to depart from. To leave behind, I will not abandon, I will not forsake, and I will not neglect you. But I'm going to do everything that I have done, or until I have done, which means to accomplish everything that I've spoken or declared or promised to you. And then lastly, he says, I will bring thee, which means to cause you to return back into this land. I want to look at something here, the four-point promise of God or the four-point covenant of God. Number one is companionship. Number two is safety. Number three is guidance. And number four is guarantee. Number one is companionship. He says, I am with you. Number two is safety. He says, I will keep thee in all places where thou goest. Number three is guidance. I will bring you back to this land. And number four is guarantee. I will not leave you until I have done that which I have said that I would do. Verses number 16 and 17. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this. Here we go. This place. And I knew it not. 
And he was, now watch this mixed emotion. He was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate. The gate was probably referring to the ladder, which we will see that that land is called the Bethel, which means the house of of God. So up to this point, uh, he was having a dream and now he awake or he got up from his dream and he recognized that he was in a place that he did not know that God was there. Sometimes we need to have that dream so God can reveal himself to us. We need that dream. We need that vision. We need that touch. We need that experience from God every now and then as an assurance. And many of us don't understand that we are where we are because God promised our father or our forefathers. So he says, surely, which means truly or even indeed or certainly the Lord, the self-existent one, the one and true and living God is in this place. He says, and I was afraid, which means to be fearful, to be dreadful and even to stand at all. He says, and how dreadful is this place? The word dreadful means fearful as afraid does, but the word dreadful also means how awesome. So it appears that he was having mixed emotions as a human being in a situation where God reveals himself unto this man. And Jacob rose early, just like his father did. He rose up early because there is an urgency. And he took the stone. Now notice, I know it appears that it was stones, but notice there's no S. He took the stone that he had put for his pillows. <laughs> Here's the question. Was it a stone or was it stones because he used for his pillows? Which one was it? That is the question. I welcome your answer. He called the name of that place Bethel. Bethel, but the name of the city was called Lutz, Luz or Luz, Luz at the first. So that place, which is also in Canaan, had an original name, yet he calls the name of that place Bethel, which means the house of God. So after this great experience, he had in a dream, he has an urgency upon him. He rises up early the next day. His rising up early the next day is different than him laying down to go to sleep. He laid down possibly in fear. He arises in a different type of fear with a mixed emotion of fear and awe at the same time. He is in a place, but he names a place. Now, it is not clear whether he is the actual, the first one to give this particular name. Remember, we're reading a, a book that has already been authored, authored by someone. So we see others uh, using the term Bethel prior to this. So it's kind of unique, but I'm going to keep on moving. What do you think? Did he actually initiate the word or was this place in existence? So Jacob rose early like his grandfather Abraham did after speaking with God, Genesis 22 and 3. Jacob will never forget this day or what took place, Genesis 35, 1 through 8. He will always remember that he was fleeing from his brother, Genesis 35 and 1. And he will always remember that he was in distress this particular day, Genesis 35 and 3. Luz or Bethel is in the land of Canaan, Genesis 35 and 6. So the Bible lets us know that he gets up and he pours oil on this particular stone, which means that he anointed the pillar with oil uh, to serve as a reminder and an anointing for what God has done for him, Genesis 35 and 13. Later, God would appear unto him as the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar. That's Genesis 35 and 11. And remember, Bethel means house of God. Israel ran to Bethel when they were in trouble, when they didn't have a king. They ran there to ask for 
uh, counsel of God when they were in distress. Judges 20 and 18. And the Bible lets us know that the Ark of the Covenant of God was located in Bethel as well. Judges 20, 26 through 28. And there were some prophets that were stationed in uh, in Bethel. And also Samuel was a part of his circuit. Uh, uh, Bethel was a part of his circuit in his travel. And lastly, and Jacob vowed a vow. The word vowed means to make a vow. And the word vow here means a promise. Saying, watch this. If God will be with me and will keep me, protect me, guide me, and cover me, and watch over me in this way that I go. In other words, when I go to Haran or Haran, and when I come back, and if he would give me food to eat or bread and raiment to put on, these are clothing, he says, so that I come again. Where? To my father's house. Watch this. Not broken up, but in pieces. Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set, the word set, for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me. Now he's talking to God. Thou, thou, right here. Thou shall give me, I will surely give the tenth thereof. Ladies and gentlemen, that word tenth means the tithe, which lets us know that tithing has always existed. When you see Abraham, he's giving a tithe. When you see his son here, he's given a tithe. So tithing predated the law of tithing. I'll say that again. Tithing predated the law of tithing. Well, why did the law of tithing come? It, it came as part of the covenant agreement between God and Israel. And then God says to them, I own the land. And since the Levites cannot work and the priests, they're going to survive off of the tithe of the land. God created a system because he said, I am their inheritance. He created a system for them to survive off of called tithing. So then when he says you are cursed with the curse, watch what it says. Even this whole nation, the church is not a nation. He said, for you have robbed me, even this nation. And they said, well, how? They said through tithe and offering. We always preach tithe, but we never preach offering. Come on. I'm not speaking up against any of it. I need you to understand that tithing existed before the law. I said, and I'm bold with it, I don't tithe according to Malachi. I'm not part of the law because the law says if you miss one part of it, you are cursed. Come on now. Also, there is a six or seven year plan in tithing. Every certain years, the tithe was to go to a group of individuals. Come on now. If we're going to do the tithing system according to Malachi, then every three years, you need to give the tithe to the widowless, to, to the widows, to the fatherless, to the strangers, to whoever. Come on now, if you're going to go by Malachi. If not, then drop Malachi and tithe so God can bless you. I'm not against tithing. I'm against Malachi. I tithe and I have tithers rights. Come on, somebody. So that's it. Two announcements. Two announcements. Uh, and I need to update this. Uh, November 11th is my 60th birthday. I will be 60 years old November 11th. There was a birthday celebration for me November the 19th at the church where I pastor at 4 o'clock. We will be having a musical. I want everybody to get in your planes, your boats, your cars, your skates, your mopeds, your spiders. Get on ships or however you get there. Uber, Lyft, camels, mules, donkeys, whatever, or walk hitchhike, uh, back, back, backstroke or something. But I want you to come and help me celebrate. I will only make 61 times. That is it right there. And lastly, I am bringing the teacher's lounge that I have on Facebook to the Faith Temple Church of God in the Christ. Shout out to Evangelist. Where is her name? Etna Tone. There it is. There's a $10 fee at the door uh, so that 
you can be able to receive some things. There is a luncheon and materials that will be supplied. Faith Temple is 71, I believe it is 38 South uh, Peoria Avenue. Make sure you show up for this. And if you would like me to bring the Sunday School Luncheon or the Sunday School Teachers Lounge to your various church, city, state, whatever, reach out to me at Rodney Jones, Sunday School at gmail.com. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share this lesson. Drop some notes, drop some comments. Let's talk about this specific lesson. Go back and read the questions that are. Uh, I put on the floor and let's see if we can answer these questions. Uh, I'm getting prepared for my couples retreat. We try to go on a couples retreat every three, every quarter, every four months. And uh, is it three months or every four months? We don't do ministry at the couples retreat. We retreat from ministry so we can relax and get breath. This time we have six couples going. Uh, we will be staying in an Airbnb. If everyone will be under the same roof, we will be in Michigan and or Michigan City. Forgot where it is, but we will be there having fun. The men cook the first night, the women cook the second night, and then we go to breakfast and nobody cooks that particular morning. But we celebrate, we have fun. And that's what I think a couple's retreat need to be about, having fun. Uh, remember my motto? teaching the word of God in the spirit of excellence. And the Lord say the same, the Lord's will, the Lord delays coming. If I don't oversleep, I will see you this coming Sunday at nine o'clock live on our Facebook um, and all of the other social medias, uh, YouTube and all of that. Remember the uh, model of the Sunday school of the church of God in Christ. I'm tore up from the floor. A child saved is a soul saved plus a life. Amen.